Welcome to the Fleet Combos Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Lydon. I'm an independent journalist who's covered the fleet industry for over 15 years. And I started this podcast because I spend a lot of time talking with smart people about the future of transportation and fleet management. And I wanted to share some of those conversations with you. In this episode, I talk with Colin Sutherland, the Executive Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Geotab, an Ontario, Canada-based telematics company. So, what's on the horizon for the fleet telematics industry? What new developments in telematics should you keep your eye on in the next 12 months? As the U.S. and the world grapple with the impacts from the COVID-19 pandemic, these are challenging times to get an accurate read on any market let alone telematics. But Sutherland does his best sharing his outlook on this episode of the Fleet Combos. I wanted to just learn a little bit more about your background, just to ensure I've got this correct. Your official title at uh, Geotab is? Executive Vice President, Sales and Marketing. Okay. And if if I recall looking at you, you've been there pretty much from the beginning or are you one of the co-founders or yeah so one of the co-founders so four of us four of us started geotab back about 20 years ago yeah uh, here since the beginning and uh, we started the company up here in north america uh, this is our 20th anniversary year actually really yeah Con- congratulations on that what what led you to get into the transportation telematics arena because that that was early days uh, for the telemax industry, if I recall, was definitely early days. So back in the in the nineteen nineties, I worked as in the uh, for, for Freightliner division of Daimler. Uh, okay. So I managed the aftermarket division for for they call it customer support division, mm-hmm. um, but it was the aftermarket parts and service for all Freightliner dealers in Canada. I was part of a NAFTA group from about nineteen ninety six to nineteen ninety nine. Yeah. And uh, during that period, of course. Uh, we, you're right, we would go to like a truck show, like Mid-America Truck Show, and we'd be talking about telematics because Daimler had this black box, they called it back then, that they had launched, um, developed in Germany, and they brought yep. over, put it into one model. I remember it was like the 1999 Mats show, and we had owner-operators coming up to us saying, if you put that into my truck, it's the last darn truck I ever buy from you guys. And nobody <laughs> wanted black boxes in their trucks back in right. 20 years ago. But I was really interested in the technology because over in Europe, it was ubiquitous. I mean, everyone was using uh, this technology back in the late 1990s. Um, and the automotive white van space or even in the, you know, the traditional business area for delivery vehicles, especially for personal use, if you could use the vehicle for personal use as well as business use, yeah. as part of your tax return every year, you had to submit a log of here's my personal trips, here's my commuting trips, here's my business trips. And you right. submit that with your tax return every year as a logbook. And I thought, mm-hmm. you know, why it's really cool technology. It was being used for safety. Diagnostic codes were coming from the vehicle using over CAN. Back then it wasn't CAN. It was um, J1708, but we we're still getting codes from the vehicle. Yeah, Domino absolutely. reading straight from the vehicle. And I thought, that's so cool. Why is North America not adopting this great technology? Um, so I found the supplier over in Europe that, that we're using on uh, this technology. At that time in 1999-2000 is when, unfortunately, the truck market took exactly what we're experiencing right now. We were leasing football fields and parking trucks out yeah. on football fields because we couldn't sell them. The remarket value through, went through the floor. And yeah. um, so we ended up winding down Freightliner back then. And I said, well, that's really great. What am I going to do for my next chapter? I don't want to move to Portland, Oregon and continue to work at head office and deal with sure. this. And I just love this technology, the idea of... I thought North America would be about five years behind, but the idea of making decisions on data was really important. I met my partners then in 2000, and we said uh, they were had just come over from South Africa, where Geotab originally started back in the uh, mid 1990s. Yeah, and um, I said, you know, my experience has been that I'm passionate about this technology. I love sales. I love sales channels. Love the adoption of it for truck fleets and business fleets. I'm not so into the consumer aspect. I think businesses need this technology to make informed decisions. Yeah. And the cool part about Geotab was that it was, it, it was a software focused organization. We didn't see the role as building black boxes that we could put into vehicles. Um, we said, we can build a device. We record data really uniquely mm-hmm. in the device, but the product we're actually producing is data that can be consumed by businesses to make decisions. And I love that philosophy that Neil Cause, our CEO and founder had 
with respect to this technology. And I just brought my knowledge of sales channels and trucking and passion for transportation into Geotab. Neil our, is our chief product manager, our chief guru of technology is phenomenal yeah. mind when it comes to this technology. And I just was able to bring the sales and marketing aspect of the business. So together we, we went forward and we grew up this organization to be the largest of its kind in the world today. Awesome. And since you've been around since the early days, I'm curious, uh, what are the key kind of progressions that you've seen? Because I would imagine originally everything was local to the vehicle and then the advancements being now you're starting to get real-time data, connectivity, and so forth. But kind of walk me through as someone that's seen the developments in the industry, what you've seen. Yeah, so the first five years from 2000 to 2005, you're right, it was all about collecting data in the vehicle, and in some cases, even manually transferring the data from the vehicle environment into the computing environment using USB keys and mm -hmm. other methods. Um, the cost for cellular back then was very expensive. Cellular modems were $300 for just a cellular modem alone to add on to your device. So wow, so it'd be like 300 bucks per vehicle just to have plus cellular. The, plus the device, so you'd be $600 per vehicle, mm. $700 per vehicle, yeah. and then a monthly fee, like 30 or $40 a month was expensive. The cellular costs were so expensive. Mm -hmm. so what we call passive technology, just data recording and moving it into the computer was very affordable. Um, around 2005 was when we saw a shift in that, that business model. So it moved from the first five years, 2000, 2005, to collecting data, and then mm -hmm. moving environment to cellular transmitting from 2005 2010 because modem costs came down right. dramatically like down to sub 100 dollars for the modem itself wow cellular prices came down so we saw this transition now the difference there uh, sean was that the data was still processed on a local laptop computer so cloud-based hmm. computing hadn't existed back then sure five to ten um, again then so the next evolution was going from passive recording of data to just the ease of over the air transmission of data using cellular and being affordable to transmit data over cellular network by having on-premises databases. Okay. 2000 to 2010 to 2015 was kind of where the cloud computing came on board. Um, Microsoft launched their products, Google launched their products. Mm -hmm. They're the primary drivers of that. And we embraced that idea and we launched um, Geotap in the cloud around 2012. Okay. Um, so short, we were very early adopters of cloud-based systems. We rewrote our software, which was CD-ROM installed on a local machine wow. to yeah. cloud-based install. So that was a complete okay. rewrite of the software back then. And, um, and that was that next evolution of cloud-based, which is where we are today. And I think okay. the difference between where we are now in 2020 and that evolution for the last 10 years, which has really gone from on-prem computing to cloud-based computing, Okay. Is um, still in our industry. It was very much reports and dashboards. People would get these spreadsheets emailed to them, and they would look at it. Or you might even get alerts, and you'd manage by exception. Okay. Um, the data science world is really taken over now. So the artificial intelligence, and machine learning stuff, is really where the next evolution of this industry is. Okay. So the, you know, kind of the early part of 2010 to 2015, as things migrated to the cloud. Basically, it was just an, another storage system for the data that the original systems would collect. It was basically historical data. And what you're saying now, the evolution has been in recent years, is to machine learning and new ways of using that data, perhaps to, I, I don't know if you can kind of tell me how that, the role that machine learning and artificial intelligence is having on um, the use of the data that the systems are collecting now. Yeah, well, think, let's think about that. The habits that we had to use before when we had that on-prem environment in that mm -hmm. 2010 to 15 environment. Let, let, let me hit the pause button. When you say on-premises, you're talking about on the vehicle itself, or are you talking oh. about the data system, the servers that are on-prem with the company? In your yeah. laptop computer, your desktop computer, exactly, versus cloud-based. So on-prem would mean the data would go from the vehicle over the air, over the cellular network, hitting some server, but then it would eventually come straight down into your local machine in your, in your Got it. Okay. A lot of laptops and, you know, these desktop machines, we can forget what they look like anymore. No one buys desktop computes, computers anymore. No, I don't. Yeah. Or Chromebooks these days. But think about the updates that we had to do for our software back then in that, mm -hmm. that, that on-prem environment. It would be annual. So you would have an annual software update 
you'd get the CD mailed out to you. You put the CD into your computer, it would mm-hmm. run the update and you'd get all these brand new reports and dashboards and everything would look different. And, it'd Absolutely. Be annual. and we lived with that 10 years ago. That was standard business operating procedure, right? Mm-hmm. And then when we moved to the cloud, it was okay. Well, no longer do we have to wait annually to give you new features. If you want a brand new feature, we can just publish that to your database like instantly. Sure. And we, so we invented more rigor around, uh, we don't have to have annual updates. We could do patches mm-hmm. in time. We could do full on updates of the software more routinely. Um, today we do them every quarter. So every three months we update all of our customers to the brand new build, new dashboards, new reports, new features. Every single three months, everyone gets that. And we deploy that in phases over a three month period so that everybody's on that same build going forward. So the agility that cloud computing gives you is phenomenal versus the old, you know, CD-ROM upgrade model yeah. um, from 10 years ago. And now you're right this, so that's in the data environment. So now we have this environment where we had to train ourselves and our and customers to get used to that because IT departments weren't used to the idea of, well, uh, I have to update my software every three months. Mm-hmm. I don't understand that. You know, I'm used to having to get a CD and approve mm-hmm. that through IT. And it's a, it takes one year for us to approve any update to our software. So culturally, I think that we, as people, you know, have, have become used to the idea that software just happens. Yeah. In fact, security patches, we know that there's always cybersecurity threats out there. Mm-hmm. We're used to the idea that a security patch must be applied to your computer today because vulnerability was found. And you're used to that. Or yeah. 10 years ago, well, on prep, you, you wouldn't have that. You, it, would be, it would be months before you do apply even a security patch. Mm-hmm. So we've trained ourselves corporately as individuals, as businesses to move at the pace of cloud computing. Yeah. And that's been the adjustment for the last five years. Now we're at that phase of have we trained ourselves to become used to the idea that data is being collected? And what mm. is the privacy use of that data? Where, where did we draw the line of that data is mine is it for my personal use when do i mm-hmm. want to have that data aggregated for more of a data science project right am i comfortable that people are using the data that i'm collecting also in an anonymous environment for data science projects and it's taken um i think the last two years of lots of dialogue um around that from okay. uh, facebook and other people kind of screwing up a little bit with it to be honest um, right overreaching but then right now, I mean, we're front and center where people would have these great debates about should we allow data to be used from cell phones in an aggregate anonymous purpose mm-hmm. and privacy people would object. And what's happened in the last three weeks, Sean? I mean, we've seen, you know, people using their cell phones on the beach, but the government's using that to figure out where people are located and the, the risks evolved. And if we didn't yeah. have that ability to aggregate all that data into a common place then governments couldn't use that for analysis to figure out how are people congregating and grouping and are there risks associated with that congregation or not? Yeah. We still, this is still an ongoing debate. It's not been finalized by any stretch at all. Sure. California is trying their best. They did something called CCPA a couple of years ago, the California privacy act. They're trying to deal with the idea of um, what is my right as an individual that generates data to make sure that I know where Mm -hmm. my data is being stored Mm -hmm. and where is it not being stored. And the California Privacy Act, it it gives some reassurance to businesses that the data that you are generating is being stored. Even if it's in the cloud, the company that's storing it in the cloud is not able to do whatever they want with your data. They have Mm -hmm. to account for all the levels of data storage. And at least that's what CCPA gives businesses. And of course, it's not restricted just to California. If you have to be compliant for for CCPA in California, you have to be compliant for everybody in North America, irrespective of where the vehicle is. Got it. Now, how would you describe the state of the fleet telematics industry right now? What has been the impact of COVID-19 on the industry, whether it's demand, fleet usage, new capabilities becoming available or important? What, if anything, has changed? Yeah, so we've um, we monitor that closely. We have a blog post that we refresh live. So we have live maps that are being updated on our blog posts. Um, what we've seen is, generally speaking, a reduction in the number of trips and distances driven by about 20% from what we would call normal. Mm. So what we study is the date from March 15th to the previous six weeks. So February 1st to March 15th, we've averaged all the trip and the distances being driven, and we've defined that as normal activity. 
and that's so that normal is 100%. And then we've mm -hmm. declined from March 15th going forward, a number of different things like the number of trips taken and distances being driven, fuel up events. We're looking at how many uh, times vehicles are fueling up. Mm -hmm. but we've broken it down by light duty, medium duty, heavy duty, off-road construction, and then other asset classes. Yeah. And we can break all that trip and distance and fueling up activity down by vehicle class types, as well as by stop locations. So something mm -hmm. called zones. So are you stopping in a grocery store? Are you stopping yeah. in a warehouse, an office, a retail location? And we're able to track all that. Um, we floored out for the vast majority of them fell to the bottom about two weeks ago at around 78% of normal. So about 20, 22% gotcha. drop. Okay. It's, it's actually leveling off and actually slightly improving now. Really? Across almost every sector. The only sector that we have not seen improved by vehicle class type is automotive. So cars are still parking at home. Sure. I think, I think what we've tried to define for ourselves, Sean, is the definition of non-essential and essential. Mm. So if you're an essential fleet, you're out there conducting business, with, but you've seen probably a reduction of 20% to 22% in your overall trips and distance. Yeah. That hasn't been 30 or 40 or 50%. The class yeah. that has seen that dramatic drop has been the automotive fleets, which I think we can, apart from some of the frontline healthcare workers that are driving vehicles to do their job, a lot of the automotive fleets were in that classification of non-essential business mm -hmm. or are the ones that are parked in your driveway and not moving. Yeah. And then we can see the, re the, the reaction of that because your vehicles aren't being driven. We can see fewer fuel up events for those cars. Mm -hmm. We can see that there's not glass windshields being replaced because vehicles aren't having their glass broken because they're not driving. There's no stone chips out there. So we can see the reaction of some of the uh, secondary markets to the fact that vehicles aren't being driven or maybe they are being driven. Yeah. Now, when you mentioned you had a blog post with the map updated, what kind of information is on that uh, blog post that you're updating? So is it similar to what you're talking about here? Just some yep, of these things? Trips distances, uh, distances driven. You can see uh, stops inside those various zone types. Those are all there. Okay. Um, there's some really neat breakdown, breakdowns by uh, city. So we're looking okay. at urban congestion, traffic light stops. So we can see how cities are being affected. You can look mm. at New York City from 100% normal in March through today and just how exactly traffic has come to a virtual standstill sure. in New York versus the other cities around. And interesting for Canada, for example, Vancouver has almost backed up completely to where it was before. Uh, gotcha. Um, yeah. Because Vancouver is beginning to lift some of the restrictions in the city and we can see that in the data. Okay. What we're hoping to do, um, in fact, today is Earth Day. So happy Earth Day, Sean. Um, <laughs> you too. We're also tracking CO2. Yeah. We look at all the CO2 by fuel consumption. Mm -hmm. We're looking at the drop in CO2 emissions over the last six weeks. Yeah. We want to also monitor that as industries recover. We're hoping that we'll be able to train some of those fleets that do use fuel despite mm -hmm. the price of fuel at the pump. Yeah. CO2 doesn't know what the price that you paid for the fuel. It just knows that it's out the tailpipe. We're yeah. hoping we're going to able, uh, we'll be training some of those customers on best practices of not how to idle the engine. Um, we are seeing an increase in speed, which is something in the blog post. Um, yeah. So more speed and actually more crashes are occurring now. Despite okay. less traffic on the road, we're seeing an increase in speed and, and severe crashes. And that's a problem. So we, we know that we still have to train drivers that are on the road driving. Mm. Don't speed, right? Sure. You wear your seatbelt, be safe behind the wheels. So those are all things that we can see and we're sharing in our blog posts. Gotcha. So there, there, there are some dangers that are a result of the roads being you know, a lot, a lot less traffic then. Yeah. So less congestion on the yeah. roads and significantly less congestion. We can see the average speed picking up and we can see the increase in harsh braking, harsh cornering and harsh acceleration, um, which is translated. We know by talking to some of the insurers out there, um, yeah. it has translated into more crashes on the road and more serious crashes. Now has the crisis led to any interesting innovations or stories on how essential services fleets are using telematics, whether it's for safety, efficiency, productivity, vehicle maintenance, or whatever area that you're seeing some innovation? Well, yeah. Thank you for that question, Sean. And I, I can yeah. tell you that we, um, I met back in January this year with one of our clients. It's a utility um, in the Southeast of, of the United States. Mm -hmm. And we discussed it uh, with, uh, with them, something that I've wanted to do for a very long time. It's how can we get the utilities to collaborate when a natural disaster occurs? Now, this mm -hmm. isn't necessarily 
COVID related, but it does sure. give us storm response. A sit. It's storm response, but it's shared resources. So how can mm -hmm. all we, when we you know God help us, but hurricane season is knocking on our door a couple of, of months. Yeah. From now. And I'm in Florida. So there we're in the so epicenter of it. Happens, and we have mm -hmm. all those great utilities to come in and support us, not just utilities, but you know, some of our clients like Mexico, <laughs> they bring the water in mm -hmm. and there's other, you know, first responders on the ambulance side. There's all those great resources that come in and yeah. they, we know actually what it looks like. We've been doing this for a while now and we've been studying hurricanes and yeah. we know what the traffic patterns look like as they, people evacuate, mm -hmm. as the residents people are evacuate, where fuel needs to be delivered. We understand um, how the first responders come in to resolve after a storm. But the yeah. problem that I'm hearing is that there's a lack of a coordinated response. Yeah. We need assets, all those assets that are coming together to be sharing their location with a central dispatch. We need efficient FEMA um, funding recovery. So it's, yeah. it's the host state, Florida, all those resources come into your host state to help out after a hurricane. Sure. It's not the feet to Florida to account for all the miles to reimburse all those people that came into the state to help out. Yeah. And how do they recover the funds? For that, well, if we could measure it by having a shared data center that could bring all those resources to a common data center, we know where the assets are, mileage is being driven, fuels being consumed, how to effectively yeah. dispatch. Um, that's something that Geotap has at its disposal. In our, in our data, our architecture enables us to donate a multi-stream environment to have all these different hardware devices collab or combine into a single common database. So we created a project uh -huh. called Project FEMA about three weeks ago. We have a leader of that. We okay. reached out to six different agencies, including the state of California, um, that, that they're very interested because of the fire situation that happened the last couple of fire seasons in California. Absolutely, yeah. They're also interested in that. So uh, it's something that, Sean, like if, you, you know, if you're interested in following along with that, I think that that's the greatest thing that we can see coming from it is that we've got um, some people that are of great engineering minds in our organization mm -hmm. that have had not the had had the benefit of time for the last two or three weeks to rethink how can we engage in these really meaningful projects today because we're less busy. So how can we make sure that if we're even slightly less busy, let's donate our hours to these great projects and get them moving forward. So if I understand correctly, the what this innovation would be is that you could you could be agnostic to the hardware that's being placed on the vehicle itself, but still be able to stream that data into a central dashboard. So whoever's coordinating those uh, storm response efforts is able to see that, but you're also recording data that would be important in terms of FEMA funding and everything else um, across the board, regardless of whose hardware is on that vehicle. Is, is that correct or correct me where exactly right sean that's exactly the goal okay and that's been expressed that that is something that the uh that the utility customers that we currently have mm -hmm. are very much wanting to try to solve for and how to do it cost effectively without having people to pay for a brand new device to install in different vehicles most utility vehicles out there currently have some form of a telematics device yeah, can ingest and does ingest today third-party hardware all over the place. Yeah, what we also have though is something called privacy mode, so we can just take pieces of data from those third-party devices and only populate the information that's needed by the needed. central dispatcher without giving up the private information that's captive to the driver okay. and to the home fleet. How far away is this, or how long until this type of capability would be would, would be operational and available to utility fleets it's it could be operational in the next two weeks we just need to have um, utility fleets become aware of the project we've got so we've all we've, we've found in six or seven different customers of ours that are rather large utility fleets but we've also sure. invited our customer pepsico because they're also part of the recovery aspect right as well as some of the first responders so it's not just utility mm -hmm. we want to include first response as well as some of the infrastructure fueling companies and mm -hmm. water organizations like pepsico yeah. And bring those people together and let's just get this uh because we've got the architecture done the architecture's existed that's we're built on that architecture it's yeah. simply a matter of having a round table of people that can focus this is what it should look like we agree on this is what it should look like become the stakeholders um, we're offering up our platform at no cost to do this how can we go ahead and and 
just engage, right? Because it's the yeah. technology is available. We just need engagement and, and guidance from that team of, uh, of customers to, yeah. to lead us and how do they want us to behave. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, if you were to peer into your crystal ball and right now, most people's crystal balls are cracked. I mean, <laughs> good luck, you know, being able to see anything accurate. But if you could, and you're looking out, say, the next six months, 12, maybe at most 18 months, in addition to this idea of being able to stream from multiple types of hardware, what are some of the other trends that utility fleet managers should be, should have on the radar in terms of, of telematics? What, what are the top trends in telematics that you should be looking out for? Yeah, I think what we're really interested in is... Um... It's a fuel tax recovery. So when you do have to pay for fuel, um, mm -hmm. a lot of utilities will pay fuel, um, you know, colored fuel that's tax free and they fuel up on their own prem. Mm -hmm. But often a utility will go out into market and have to pay for fuel out of pump just like everybody else. And it's right. taxable and that tax money should be recovered um, where the fuel is being used for, you know, non-highway driving. Sure. And um, there are some uh, companies that have, uh, operationalize that in a very mm -hmm. simple way to be able to go and have that tax money brought back. So what that means is you're going to want to start capturing um, where your vehicle is located. You're going to want okay. to capture the PTO activity of a boom arm up and down mm -hmm. um, light bars and how they're being used. Yeah. Um, I would like to think that, you know, there are, will be electric vehicles. And if you go to, you know, act expo is normally the place that we would go to in May and see the, the latest utility electric vehicles. I would like to think that we're going to see electrified vehicles enter into the utility space and more of, yeah. a, of a bucket truck environment. I would like to think that that's going to be true in the next two years. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't keep our, our finger off of that, uh, off of that, but we need to continue to push forward for electric and sustainability initiatives. Um, you know, the utilities generate electricity. So um, maybe they should uh, be driving electric vehicles that consume the same products that they, that they generate if you're in the electric utility space. Um, so those are the trends I think that we're looking at is just more measurement of exactly how the vehicle is performing. Mm -hmm. We do something called an electric vehicle suitability assessment. Okay. It's primarily used by vehicle fleets to identify which combustion vehicles should be candidate for electric. Mm. We do that by running. We know exactly how the vehicle's driving, go uphill, downhill, duration, battery state of charge, okay. battery state of health. So we can identify exactly the candidate vehicles to go electric. And then we can help the utilities plan in electric charging infrastructure. We do that with our smart charge rewards platform, which is more consumer okay. facing, but it's to help with peak load management. So we want all those electric vehicles being charged off peak. So they get the, the pricing advantage of being charged off peak. Right. But, you know, obviously, um, uh, you know, still being fully charged for the next duty cycle. So we've got all those tools in our toolkit as far as our consulting capability with fleets to show them where they can go electric, how they can go electric and build out uh, infrastructure around that. Um, I think it's more holistic. We'd like to see uh, you know, the utility fleets that are not just out there on the front line, but their front line workers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it could be that with social distancing, I was thinking about this the other day when you often have a utility fleets, you know, a crew of maybe two vehicles plus a supervisor, you might even have a pickup truck and two vehicles and possibly five or six crew members going to any given job. Yeah. Are you going to be able to have a driver and a passenger in the vehicle itself? I'm yeah, sure the fleets I've been talking about, they've been separating them. So yeah. using, using more than one vehicle for two, two people. Exactly. So maybe you can have I mean, some of our clients to rental car companies that actually mm -hmm. can offer you know, rental alternatives. Mm -hmm. um, so short term, like it's not long term. That might be a six month to one year alternative until vaccines and things are created and feel, people feel confident about getting crews back together into the same cab. But yeah. over the next 18 months, I think the idea of just how can we continue to do the job function, yeah. keep our employees safe and healthy, mm -hmm. give them alternatives so they can drive their own vehicle and not share vehicles even. That's the hard part. Like if you Absolutely. have a shared vehicle wiping down the dash and so yeah. give them, this is your vehicle, you have it. It's maybe a rental cars are, are a short-term alternative. Mm -hmm. that we should be evaluating that with some of the rental car partners that we currently have. And um, yeah, I think that that's uh, probably what we're, we're going to be in for, Sean, over the next uh, 18 months is trying to adapt. We, the show must go on. Yeah. Uh, infrastructure is essential. We need our frontline workers to be safe. Yeah. We also need to keep the, the infrastructure up and running 
and we have to prepare for those disaster events that we know inevitably happen with tornadoes and different things that happen. Yeah. And uh, we can be planning for that today. I think that if we kind of stay in that zone of preparation for the next six months to you know 18 months, mm -hmm. I think we'll be in, in good shape. And I think, quite frankly, the utility fleets will be um, asset balanced very well. They'll know what assets yeah. are being used. Yeah. They'll account for not just the powered assets, but also all the non-powered new technologies coming out for those generators mm -hmm. that are expensive, but you don't necessarily track them. There's really great new technologies that are not expensive at all. They're very affordable that you can put onto those assets too, to know exactly all of the assets that you have, how they're being used. Um, that's, that's the so, that so you would on. see an expansion beyond just the, the on-road or even off-road powered assets to some of these other assets that would be part of the fleet, you know, they're pieces of equipment, generators, um, you know, spool trailers and things like that and pole trailers that they would also have some sort of tracking to them. Is that all it is? It's a little expensive thing. It's called a low energy Bluetooth tag. Mm -hmm. it's all very, very inexpensive. You mm -hmm. put that onto the, uh, onto whatever you have. It's non-powered. It's battery mm -hmm. operated. It lasts for a long time. And yeah. then in the cab, you have a, a blue, a low, a low energy Bluetooth reader. Mm. And essentially all those assets have just a little ID, it's a little signature ID. Sure. And they're constantly pinging away saying, here's my ID, here's my ID, here's my ID. Mm -hmm. And with the, with, the, with the vehicle itself, you say, here are all the IDs that I expect to be part of this, of this trip, whether it's a Got trailer it. or a generator or whatever might be there. Okay. If any one pieces of those, of that inventory is missing, or got left behind at a job site, you drive away and you left a generator in the field, you'll mm -hmm. get an instant alert saying you just left something behind. Got and it. You have to drive three hours to go back and recover it. You instantly know that all those assets are accounted for. And some of those assets are expensive and you don't want to leave them behind for the sake of this little tiny low energy Bluetooth. Now with that low energy Bluetooth, are you able to track that apart from the vehicle being near it or connected to it? Or is it, it has to be kind of local to where that vehicle is and attached, uh, you know, in some way attached to the vehicle? Yeah, there, there are two different um, types of tags. One of them is simply Bluetooth only. It's just okay. literally a beacon that sends out by Bluetooth a signal. And unless you yeah. have a reader, which could be a cell phone or a device like ours attached to our device, sure. um, you're not able to read it. Otherwise, yeah. you can also get a cellular failover device. So it's a standalone device that okay. comes away. Um, it's a little self-defeating there to have a, a pinging device to say, here's where I'm located and yeah. also have the expensive Bluetooth in there too. Sure. Um, but uh, you could do that. If, if the uh, asset demanded it, you could do that. There Got are some it. other technologies coming out in Q3 this year. Very promising, low cost, uh, cellular technologies. Mm. It's called CAT-M. It's this new low energy cellular modem. So it's not low mm. energy Bluetooth, it's low energy cellular. Again, mm. can operate on battery power, so it doesn't consume a lot of battery. Yeah. That's the technology innovation that came with CAT-M. And, and again, that's CAT, C-A-T-M as a Mary. Category M, yeah. Got it. Exactly. The little uh, battery power CAT-M modem. And you're mm. gonna see these little CAT-M modems installed in elevators, escalators, wow. coasters. I mean, they are so low cost and mm -hmm. they can provide diagnostic data of whatever dishwashers, whatever might be running. Um, it'll be standard equipment as you go forward. Almost every electric appliance you've got will have a little CAT-AM modem built into it. And it will not rely on the Bluetooth to give you the signal. It will just sure. set it up over the cellular network. This is the diagnostics of this particular appliance or piece of hardware. And uh, you'll just be reacting to it. And that's a, that CAT-AM modem really started coming out towards the mid 2019, about a year mm. ago. Um, awesome. But now the modem manufacturers are becoming more accessible. Okay. And we've been working with that technology for a while now. So we are able to bring it to market in 20, probably would have already been to market quite honestly. Sure. Now, um, three month delay in coming to market because of, uh, you know, some of the factories have been shut down. But I expect by Q3, Q4, you'll see okay. an awful lot of discussion on CAD-M and uh, how that will help. Awesome. Now, is there, as we close out, is there anything that we haven't talked about today that you think would be important for utility fleet professionals to know about when it comes to the, you know, what's going on in the telematics world right now or what to look for? 
Yeah, I, I think that, that the, well, number one, I, I would I haven't had the opportunity, but I would like to thank them in the front, thank the frontline workers, mm -hmm. of, um, all the folks that are on the front line. You know, we, a lot of uh, comment about truckers has been out there in the media and truckers are driving uh, you know, our economy, they're delivering the goods and services that we need. Yeah. Uh, we, we thank them. We thank the first line responders that are out there uh, in the medical field. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like the, the infrastructure folks that are keeping our water supplies and our electrical supplies just have not been thanked. Specific. I want to thank them specifically. Um, I recognize yeah. that if my, my cable goes down because my kids can't get mm -hmm. the streaming Netflix that yeah. is essential to right yeah. now staying at home. If I can't keep the lights on, if I can't yeah. have a clean water supply, um, then then it's, the, nothing works. And, sure. Um, you know, we we want to thank them for that. Overall, um, you know, we we recognize how essential infrastructure is to the business. Yeah. Um, I think it's an opportunity for us to go and raise the profile of the utility fleets um, with respect to government. So not all utility fleets are connected with data. Sometimes you know municipal budgets are impacted. Mm -hmm. um, and they just say, well, we don't really know why we would need data from our vehicles. Right. Often the, the vehicle itself, and this is the key, and I've been talking about this for the last several months, mm -hmm. fleet managers often are great people that uh, know how to keep the vehicle up and running. So they're, they, they're the custodian of the repair costs, the sure. fuel costs, and the operating costs of the budget of the asset. Mm -hmm. the and sometimes the, the company, the utility, will see the, the fleet department as being a cost center. And they won't see it as being a strategic asset. Yeah. And we need to um, increase the knowledge of fleet managers that the vehicles that they are driving aren't just cost centers. Right. They are actually strategic assets. We need to know where they are located mm -hmm. and where the assets are located. And they can be pre-positioned now in the case of weather storms that are coming in. There was some machine learning stuff, um, Sean, that we talked about a little bit ago that uh, we developed, which is a predictive model that says when a weather front is coming in, we know a day or two before a storm, rain, right. snow comes in, we can predict exactly where the crash zones are going to be. You know that hmm. through three or four years of history where crashes occur, right. weather events on top of crashes. So if we can predict that, we can already pre-position assets with a much higher degree of certainty than before. Hmm. Now, whether that's a hurricane or a tornado, or just a big snowstorm that comes in December. Right. Uh, educating fleet managers on not just how to run an efficient operating costed fleet, mm -hmm. understanding electric vehicles and when should I be thinking electric as a custodian vehicle, or right? A, uh, ambassador vehicle for my fleet, but understanding the data world and how mm -hmm. strategic the data is coming from those vehicles and how it can be used proactively to preposition assets, which makes them more cost effective. Yeah. Makes the position of the fleet manager much more strategic and not just the guy managing a cost center. And now you, the fleet manager of any utility becomes the strategic driver of data. And you're owning that data collection on behalf of the utility from Absolutely. all of your assets. And let's just change the mindset around that and the role of fleet managers from this cost center manager to a data manager. And we're we've developing a syllabus right now of how, um, of all the different topics that we can educate on. We're working with AFLA, the American Fleet Leasing Association yeah. on that. And we'll be launching with AFLA later on this year um, courses on uh, data custodianship or data knowledge for fleet managers. So we can Interesting. help managers become more knowledgeable about the world of data. Yeah, excellent. Well, Colin, I appreciate you taking some time out of your day today to share to share your thoughts on these topics. It's 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 really important even now. So. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us for today's episode of the Fleet Combos podcast. We'll see you next time.